بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صاحب السمو الشيخ محمد بن زايد نهيان ولي عهد ابو ظبي نائب قائد الاعلى للقوات المسلحه سمو الشيوخ اصحاب المعالي والسعاده الضيوف الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته اسمحوا لي بداية بالتعريف عن نفسي محدثكم خالد مايد الرميثي مدير إدارة التخطيط الاستراتيجي في دائرة التعليم والمعرفة وعضو في برنامج خبراء الإمارات يشرفني اليوم أن أتولى مهمة إدارة الحوار في هذا المجلس الكريم هذا المجلس الذي ينسج آفاقا جديدة للحوار البناء والهادف والذي يرتكز على العلم كقيمة راسخة وينطلق نحو فضاءات ثقافية ومعرفية أكثر رحابة من أقوال صاحب السمو الشيخ محمد بن راشد آل مكتوم نائب رئيس الدولة رئيس مجلس وزراء حاكم دبي حفظه الله أن الابتكار يعتبر كثروة مستدامة أو أساس لتطور الشعوب وتقدم للدول إلى المستقبل الحضور الكريم نرحب اليوم بالدكتور بو لوتو متخصص في علم الأعصاب ومؤسس ومدير مختبر غير المتأقلمين وهو أول استوديو للتصميم العصبي في العالم يقوم المختبر بإنشاء تجارب تفاعلية فريدة من نوعها في العالم الحقيقي لتمكين الجمهور من فهم عملية اكتشاف الحس الإدراكي إحدى أهداف الدكتور لوتو هو تمكين أشخاص الاعتياديين من فهم هذا العلم ليس من ناحية أكاديمية فحسب وإنما من مختلف نواحي الحياة والأخذ بعين الاعتبار بأن ما ندرك أو نراه لا يترجم أو يفهم بنفس الطريقة بين الأفراد وإنما يعتمد على الوعي الشخصي والمجتمعي محاضرتنا لليوم بعنوان علم الابتكار قابلية التأقلم بشكل طبيعي ونلفت عنايتكم إلى أن المحاضرة ستكون باللغة الإنجليزية وبإمكانكم استخدام السماعات لمتابعة الترجمة الفورية وبعد الانتهاء سيتم فتح المجال لطرح الأسئلة التي يمكنكم كتابتها على النشرات الموجودة أمامكم واسمحوا لي الآن بأن أكمل حديثي باللغة الإنجليزية your Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored and delighted to welcome today a very special guest speaker, a professor specialized in neuroscience, Dr. Bo Lotto, founder and CEO of Lab of Misfit Studio, the world's first neuroscience design studio. The lab creates a unique real-life experiment that places the public at the center of the process of discovery. The lab's aim is to create, expand, and apply their insights into what it is to be a perceiving human. In 2017, Dr. Lotto published his first major book titled Deviate, The Science of Seeing Differently. He draws on over two decades of pioneering research to explain that our brain hasn't evolved to see the world accurately. And now, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bo Lotto to share with us his views on the science of innovation becoming naturally adaptable. Dr. Lotto, you have the floor. Mm. Ramadan Karim, yes. So I have the interference a little bit. The, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to come. I've been trying to practice Ramadan today and yesterday, so I'm feeling a little bit lightheaded right? But I wanted to be in the same place that you are, so thank you so much. Uh, and also I've been sleeping with my door open, so I've been woken by the, morning, the call to morning prayer at 4.30, which is a beautiful sound with the, with the view of the beach and the sea, so it's been absolutely beautiful to be here. So we're going to talk about perception, right? And perception is everything it is to be human. And today, for the next 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, I want to link tolerance, because it's your year of tolerance, to innovation, because you are leading innovation. So how might these two be connected? And how might they be connected in the brain? 
And we are facing tremendous challenges right now. As we become more interconnected, our world becomes increasingly unpredictable. Right? 50, over 50% 50 of the people are now connected over the internet. Right? So what used to be a more determined fate is now affected by everyone else in the world. And what's more, our challenges are global. It's predicted that in 2050, there will be more plastic in the sea than fish. Okay? And the, the most popular jobs in 2010 didn't even exist in 2004. So we are educating children now for a world that doesn't even exist. We can't even imagine. And if we think about innovation, innovation has two sides. It has creativity and has efficiency. And almost every organization focuses only on one side of that equation, which is efficiency. And as the world changes, which is a great idea if it weren't for the fact that the world changes, and as the world changes, what we try to do is we try to increase efficiency even more, right? But we have to focus more on the other side of that equation, on creativity. And a recent survey in LinkedIn suggests the most in-demand skill in businesses right now is creativity, and the third most in-demand skill is adaptability. So how can we be more creative? Well, to be creative is to see differently. Right? to perceive differently. So perception underpins everything it is to be human. What we know, what we believe, who we fall in love with, right? how we lead, everything begins with perception. To understand perception is to not only understand how the brain works, it's to understand what it is to be human. So I could ask a question. How many of you, when you woke up this morning, thought you saw the world as it really is? How many are seeing reality, right? Anyone seeing reality? No? So I think you all, I think everyone, I think every human thinks they open their eyes and see the world as it really is. So let's just do a test. Let's see how good we are at seeing the world as it really is. Here's a fairly natural scene. 90% of the information your brain uses to see comes from grayscale, right? and there's a predator that's staring right at you. And if you haven't found it yet, you're dead, right? It's staring right at you. How many think they can see it? If I just add 10% more information, you can see it's staring right at you. Yes? Now you can see it even better. If we go back, you can see it was always there, right? So this is a fairly complex scene. Let's try something even simpler. Let's just try lightness, right? The easiest perception that our brain has. Even jellyfish see lightness, and they don't even have a brain, right? So surely, we can see the intensity of light accurately. And here we have two dots. They're exactly the same. Same in shape, same in spectral content, and they look the same, right? But what happens if we don't change the dots we just change what surrounds them. Do they still look the same? The one on the left should look lighter than the one on the right. right? This is our simplest illusion. It's called simultaneous brightness contrast, and we don't know how it works. But it makes a fundamental point about our brain and our perception, which is that context is everything. Our brain did not evolve to see absolutes. Our brain evolved to find relationships in space and time. Life is movement. If there's no change, there's nothing interesting for your brain to see. Your brain loves difference. Right? But a far deeper question is not simply that it loves difference, is why does it love difference? Why does your brain love contrast? Right? And I'm going to tell you at the most basic level of why your brain needs contrast. Imagine this is the back of your eye, okay? And this is light coming in from the world, and it's landing on the back of your eye. And these two shapes are identical in every single way. Spectral content, shape, everything about them is the same. And your brain has no access to the world other than through the light that's coming onto a retina. And at this point, your brain is being told that these two shapes are the same. 
and yet they come from completely different sources in the world. The one on the left comes from an orange object under direct illumination, oriented this way, whereas the one on the right comes from a yellow object in shadow, oriented exactly opposite direction. Completely different objects and conditions in the world giving rise to completely the same information. So how does your brain solve this? This is the fundamental problem of your brain, that data is meaningless. It's useful, but it's meaningless. It doesn't come with any meaning. It could be a large object far away or a small object up close, a loud object far away or a quiet object up close. Your brain has no way of knowing. So how does your brain solve this problem? In fact, this is the fundamental problem that your brain evolved to solve, which is that all information is inherently meaningless. It doesn't tell you what to do. So how does your brain solve it? It solves it, it solves the problem of uncertainty through, by continually redefining normality. Right? Your brain evolved to evolve. It's adapted to adapt. Your brain is continually making meaning based on its history. The functional structure of your brain is literally a physical manifestation of your past interactions with the world. Right? And I want to show you how quickly your brain can redefine normality, just using color. So I want you to first notice that these two desert scenes are the same in terms of color. One is just the flipping of the other. Okay? And I want you to stare at the dot between the red and the green. I want you to look right there. Okay? Don't look anywhere else. My children love this. So just look right at that dot. Don't look anywhere else. And we're going to do it for 30 seconds. All right? Stare at that dot. Your brain is learning. It's learning that the left side of its visual field is under green light, the right side is under red light. That's becoming its new reality. It's adapting, right? You're also getting very sleepy, right? Keep looking at that dot. Don't look anywhere else. When I tell you to, I'm going to ask you to look at the dot between the desert scenes, but not yet. Three, two, one. Look at the dot between the desert scenes. Do they still look the same? No, the one on the left will look reddish. The one on the right will look greenish. And as you look around, your brain will again redefine normality. And we're just talking about color. Imagine what's true in everything else that our brain is doing. And what's more, your brain makes meaning not by passively receiving information, but by physically engaging with the world. Your brain lives in the real world. Our brains evolved in a body and a body in a world. Silicon Valley keeps forgetting this, right? I'll tell you a story of two kittens, all right? They're just recently come into the world, just born, eyes just open, and one of the kittens is allowed to run around on the ground, okay? And that kitten is actually linked, physically linked to another kitten that's suspended in a basket. So wherever the one on the ground goes, the one on the basket also goes. So they have the same visual experience of the world, okay? And after a period of time, they test the vision of the one on the ground, and it sees perfectly fine. But what about the one in the basket? What does it see? It's had the same visual experience of the world. It's blind. Its eyes are open, but it can't see. Because it's never been able to physically interact with the physical world and make meaning so it has nothing to see. And as you let the kitten run around for a couple of days, it literally learns to see, okay? So when we open our eyes, what do we see? There is a world, it's just that we don't see it. We don't see it accurately because it's forever separate from our brains. Nor do we see the information coming from the world because that would be meaningless. It could literally mean anything. So we instead, our brain evolved to see a meaning that was useful to see in the past. That's what we always see. But what was once useful may no longer be useful, which is why your brain evolved to change. So what do I mean by seeing meaning? Here we have a cube. This is an image I made many years ago. And you'll see a dark tile at the top and a light orange tile at the side. Okay? 
That is your perceptual reality. You would bet your life that those are different, when in fact, they're exactly the same. Nothing on the screen is changing, right? You're seeing the meaning of the data, not the data. Those colors are changing not on the screen, they're changing in your mind. And what's true for color is also true for form. These two tables are the same. Agreed? No? The, re the red table is nothing other than the green table on its side. They have the same dimensions. The height of the red one is the same as the width of the green one, and vice versa. You're seeing the meaning of the dimensions, not the dimensions. And what's true for color and form is also true for more complex perceptions, like our combination of sound and light. So here, this is a documentary we made for the BBC many years ago, and you'll, I'm going to play his sound, and you're going to hear some letters, okay? Fa, fa, so you hear a fa, fa like F, fa, fa, fa. Okay? On the right, you're going to hear a ba, like boy. Okay, now we're going to put them together. You're going to hear a fa on the left and a ba on the right. Ba, 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 yes? Ba, ba, now close your eyes. Ba, ba, How many sounds do you hear? Ba, ba, There's one sound ba, ba, ever. Ba, if you see his lips make the shape of an F, you hear a fa. If you see his lips make the shape of a B, you hear a ba. Nothing is changing. We could look at this forever, right? Some of us do. So everything we're doing is a reflex, right? We have no free will in the moment. Everything you're doing right now is a reflex based on your history, and not just your own individual history, the history of your family, the history of your culture, the history of your business, your evolutionary history. Most of our life happened without us even there. Okay? And these reflexes and these assumptions and biases that are inside our brains just don't stay there. They get projected out into the world. This screen is not blue. There's light but it's not blue. The color couldn't be closer to you. It's literally inside your head, projected outward. You are coloring this screen. Light exists, but it is not colored. So if a tree falls in the woods and no one else is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Do the waves make a sound when they come onto the beach? No. They create energy. The sound is a construct of your brain. And what's true for color is also true for more complex perceptions. So here we have two triangles in a circle. They mean nothing until I put them into motion. And now you're going to project a meaning onto them. Right? You hate one of the triangles. You're feeling bad for the other one. You're worried for the circle, right? This is like a horror film. You can almost hear the music. And we're going to stop it there. And you're all wondering, what happens to the circle, right? And the answer is nothing. It's a circle, OK? You projected the meaning. But if everything we're doing is grounded in our history and our biases, many of which we inherited, how could we ever see differently? How could we ever be creative? And the answer is quite simple. If you change your assumptions, we change our perceptions. If everything I'm doing is a consequence of my assumptions, and my brain makes only ever a small step, I never make a big jump. I can't get from here to the door without passing through the space in between. I can only ever make a small step, and I make a step to the next most likely possible based on my bias of assumptions. 
If I change my assumptions, I change what's next to me. Right? That is what is being creative. So why is it so? So here, I'm going to give you an example of how powerful it is to change your assumptions and your perceptions. So here we have a wireframe diamond, and we all come into the world with the assumption that we look down onto that surface. Okay? So when I spin it, you're going to see it spinning from left to right. Now I want you to change your assumptions, okay? Instead of imagining looking down at that surface, I want you to imagine looking up at it. Sometimes it helps to blur your eyes, blink, look around it, and suddenly it will go in the opposite direction. How many can get it to flip? Has anyone been able to get it to flip? And every time you blink, it'll go in the opposite direction. Yes? All you're doing is you're changing your biases and assumptions. The triangle, the, the, the um, diamond, never changes. So how many can get it to flip now? Yes? So I have a quick question for you. Which direction is it actually rotating? How many say left to right? How many say right to left? How many say, I don't care? Right? What if I were to tell you that there's no motion on the screen at all? Nothing is moving. Would you believe me? No? Nothing is moving. No, it's not. You're looking at an animation. An animation is a series of still images that are slightly different from each other. Your brain is taking that small change and seeing it as motion. If I took those same images and put them in random order, you would see a flickering. So you're taking a series of still images that are still, causing it to move, and then flipping it from one direction to the other, depending on how you think about it. So why is it so difficult to change our assumptions if that's what we need to be creative? And I'm just going to give you two ideas. The first one is we've been educated to think that we're objective, that we have an accurate perception of the world. We've been educated for answers, not questions. Okay? It's like being educated to be a sous chef, but not a chef. But instead, we actually perceive the history of what we perceived before. Here's an example in Britain, right? In Britain, they have these two taps. Why? Right? You get your hands really hot, and then you got to cool them down, and you go back and forth. Why are we doing this? Right? And if you ask a designer, they'll, they'll build you a new house, and they'll put these two taps in. Why? And the answer is because many years ago, there was a, the hot water tank was a bathtub that was in the attic. And then you'd get mouse droppings, you'd get dust. It was dangerous to drink the hot water. So they separated the hot water from the cold water. We no longer have bathtubs in the attic, right? We have hot water tanks, but we still have these two taps. Why? Because we had them before. And so much of our perception of the world, our education system, the way we run businesses, the way we relate to each other, is based on the fact that we've just done this before. Okay? Which is why creativity begins with humility. It begins with not knowing instead of knowing. Nothing interesting begins with an answer. It always begins with a question. Right? So, Creativity begins with humility, and humility is essential for tolerance. Tolerance is the ability to sit with difference as a step towards openness. Okay? Number two, we hate not knowing. Right? We hate not knowing. That's, this is one of our most biggest fears, is the fear of the dark, of not knowing. Almost every behavior you do, you do to decrease uncertainty. If you're not sure that was a predator doing evolution, it was too late, right? Dying is easy. So our brains evolved to take what is uncertain and make it certain, right? To take what is unknown and make it known. Whenever, if you ever go on a boat and you go down below on a boat, right? Your eyes are moving and register your boat, so your eyes are saying, oh, we're standing still. But your inner ears say, no, 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 we're moving. And so your brain gets ill because it can't deal with that conflict. And the uncertainty from stress 
decreases our immune function. Our immune system starts collapsing. Our brain cells wither and die. Here are two brain cells from the cerebral cortex, which is where I do our thinking, and here's one from a brain that was under tremendous stress in a very constrained environment, and the one on the right is from a brain that was under very low stress, right? in a highly diverse environment, engaging environment. We become less adaptable, right? Here's an example in Australia of someone who goes in to rob a bank. This actually happened. He goes in, and he hands the teller a note. And the bank shuts down. He's under tremendous stress of uncertainty. He can't get out, right? He spends five minutes trying to escape. What is the assumption that his brain is missing? That doors push as well as pull. It was never locked. He was trapped by his biases. And how many times have we all done this? And this is what happens with stress, right? The stress of uncertainty which is why in my lab and studio, in our education program, we only design along a single axis, the axis of uncertainty. We're either decreasing it or we're increasing it. You could argue that this is why Uber is successful. Uber is successful not because they tell you when a taxi is going to arrive. Sorry, Uber is successful not because they give, enable you to get a taxi easier. It's because they tell you when the taxi is going to arrive. Right? If you're out on the street late for a meeting, you're trying to get a taxi, and five minutes goes past, you're not sure if you're going to get it. Your cortisol levels go up, you become stressed. But if you see, oh, the taxi's there. Oh, I can see it on a map. Uber will be successful depending on how predictable the taxi arrives. In Chile, they're incredibly unpredictable. So people are moving away from using Uber. And almost every business is in the business of decreasing uncertainty. Especially if you can decrease the uncertainty of something that someone cares about, and that if you get it wrong, you have a high cost function. That is almost the definition of almost any successful company. Which is why creativity not only requires humility, it requires courage to go to the very place that we actually evolved to avoid, which is the not knowing. And courage is essential for tolerance, because if you're going to sit with someone who's different from you, that requires courage. So the two principles that are essential for innovation and creativity are also essential for tolerance. But fortunately, evolution gave us a solution, right? What is the one behavior where we actually love uncertainty? It's not that we tolerate it, we love it, right? It's a class of behaviors defined by a single word with four letters. It's play. Play is literally evolution's solution to uncertainty. It's why it evolved. And, we, we, and if you add intention to play, what do you get? You get science. Science is nothing other than play with intention. And when we created an education program based on science as play, it resulted in the youngest ever published scientist at 8 to 10 years old. And what begins play is awe and wonder, right? That's what begins a question, is awe and wonder. And we have collectively been wondering and thinking about awe and wonder for literally hundreds, if not thousands of years. And yet we don't know how it happens. And so my lab has recently collaborated with Cirque du Soleil to find out what happens when we experience awe, like this morning when I'm on the beach and I'm looking out to the sea and I'm hearing the call to prayer. Tremendous sense of awe, right? And so, in the case, what, does it, what is it and what does it do? So with Cirque du Soleil, we went and recorded the brain activity of people watching a Cirque du Soleil performance. And we involved students from the local community. And the public.
So what is awe? It's a state of the brain, right? We can now actually record whether or not people are experiencing awe, and we have an artificial intelligence system that can predict, that can mind read, whether or not people are experiencing awe to an accuracy of 75%. And what happens to people's behavior when they experience awe? Well, the first one is it increases your connectivity towards other people. You feel small but connected to the world. You decrease your need for cognitive closure. You're more willing to sit with uncertainty. And your, need, your appetite for risk increases. You're more interested in taking risk and better able at taking it. So awe is literally the perception of what is bigger than us. Right? So why care? So we'll just conclude. Consider conflict. Conflict is to be in a situation that's different from what you expect. Your brain is now in conflict. And the way we normally engage with context, conflict is if you and I are in conflict, my aim is to prove that you're wrong, to shift you towards me. The problem is his aim is exactly opposite, to prove that I'm wrong and shift me towards him. Notice that conflict is set up to win, but not learn. Your brain only ever learns when it moves. And yet we design conflict to never move. So what if awe could actually be used as a tool to not end conflict, but to engage in conflict in a new way? We need conflict. That's how your brain learns. But we need conflict in order not to shift, but to expand. So to approach, change the approach of how we enter conflict. To give us the curiosity to overcome our cowardice. Right? Maybe awe and play can actually enable the, uh, the humility and the courage to not know, right? as well as the curiosity to also understand. Because to understand another person is not to be able to measure their behavior, it's to understand the biases and assumptions that give rise to their behavior. Right? And so we've actually started a project in New York where we've actually shown where we can give people a sense of awe, and then we present them with conflict, serious conflict, and their rate of hate and anger goes down, and they actually become more creative because they have the ability to sit with diversity, and more than that, to be able to integrate across diversity. It's not enough just to have diversity. You have to be able to integrate across it. And it begins this way. Imagine what would happen if all of us entered conflict in our personal lives, with our children, in our businesses, not with an answer, but with a question, right? With the desire to understand rather than know, with the desire to understand rather than to convince, right? Which means that toleration leads, is the fundamental first step to innovation. So if you're going to go from A to B, your first step is not B. Your first step is to go from A to not A, to let go of the biases and assumptions. So where can we find awe? Do we have to go to Cirque du Soleil? Do we have to see these big experiences? What if we could find awe, which children find all the time, by the way? They're one of the best finders of awe, which is to find the impossible in the simple. So with that, I will leave you with that concept. So thank you very much for the invitation. I hope that was interesting and useful for you. Thank you, Dr. Lotto. Uh, it was such an informative lecture on the ways of the human mind. Um, until we receive questions from the audience, um, I would like to ask you some questions of my own. Okay. Um, so there was a reference to a few characteristics and to the person that should have in order to achieve a better conception of our lives. My question is, can a person become more creative with our current education systems? <laughs> and the answer is no, <laughs> right? Uh, at least I can only speak for the UK and the States. I can't speak for here. Having said that, I, gave, I was here just a few weeks ago and gave a talk, I forget the, the name of the 
where it was your, your university students. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed, uh, Future Generations Majlis. Future Generations. And I was so impressed with the students uh, who, were, who came and they asked me questions afterwards. So the answer is no, because our education system is often, at least in the States and the UK, is predicated on the Victorians, where efficiency was a really good idea, right? It was started the Industrial Revolution. The problem is our world is now much more interconnected, and so we actually have to teach children how to be adaptable. Not to know things, but how to be adaptable, right? Wisdom is not in being either creative or efficient. If you leave this room and a car is coming at you, I don't want you to think, oh, I wonder if there's a different way I can see this, right? You have to get out of the way as fast as possible. Wisdom is knowing when to be on one side or the other. And that's what we have to give our children through education. And looking at the overall perception and approach that introduce us to uncertainty and creativity, is there a tool that can upgrade our perception and actually make us see differently? Is there a tool that can help us? Yes, I think there is. So in my view, the next greatest innovation is not going to be a technology. I once spoke at the G8 on innovation, and they, it was in the UK, and they brought everyone from Silicon Valley because the assumption is that our next innovation is going to be a technology. It's not. It's a way of being. It's a way of being that will enable the innovation in technology. And that way of being is humility, courage, the awareness of how our perceptions are created, the education, but also technology itself. So if you think about there are two types of technology. There is useful technology that enables us to do what we can already do easier, faster. But there's also transformative technology. That is what enables us to see what we couldn't see before. Think of a telescope or a microscope, or an MRI, or a book, or a sail that enabled you to see cultures and environments that you've never seen before. Right? Because the best person to, to, to know what your assumptions and biases is, is usually not you. It's usually someone else. And so technology can expand our perception of the world. And we also have been introduced to the lab misfits mm. in your lecture. Um, can you maybe elaborate on one of the most impactful experiments ah. that actually took place in your studio. So the most impactful experience, I had written them down, actually. Um, my, I used to grow brain cells in a dish. So I would look to see what, what are required for your brain cells to stay alive. And what we discovered, and other labs have discovered, that the molecules that your brain cells need to stay alive are directly related to how active your brain is. The more active your brain is, the more enriched is your environment, and the more your brain cells grow. When you see two people playing chess, grandmasters playing chess, they are literally burning thousands of calories. Thinking is difficult, which is why so few people do it. Right? It literally costs energy, which is why we often take the path of least resistance. So that was one of my uh, preferred. And the other, I'd say, is when the children, working with the children, they discovered that bumblebees can follow rules, and they can make contextual decisions. And they were 8 to 10 years old. It was a question that they asked, that they were, patient, that they were passionate about. They designed the experiments, and I was the technician. And then they wrote the paper and became the youngest published scientist. And the reason why that's interesting is the finding itself was unique. It wasn't earth-shattering, but it was one that no one had asked before. And what's more, scientists said that they couldn't do it, and teachers said they couldn't do it. So we couldn't get funding, so we paid for it ourselves. Right? So I'd say that those two studies were my favorite. And then the awe study with Cirque du Soleil, because it's so wonderful working with Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> and um, in your opinion, what could be considered at risk, if I may say, if people remain at their current level of seeing the world and didn't deviate? Yeah. What's at risk if we don't deviate? To deviate, I want to be clear on what de I don't mean deviance. I mean to deviate. To deviate means following a path that's based on your previous steps as opposed to everyone else's. Right? There's tremendous courage in that. And so what's at risk? If you look at what's happening in the States, for instance, with the intolerance, what's at risk is a lack of creativity, polarization, right? literally people becoming less healthy, emotionally unhealthy, a decrease in personal relationships, right? 
To be, what I'm talking about is not simply what happens when you're at work. This is what happens when you're at home as well. So to be creative means living creatively. And um, one of the success stories in eliminating uncertainty in business was uh, Uber that was shared yeah. in the session. Um, we can understand that by doing so, we can actually start up a new successful business. Uh, so what about the current running corporates? Is it too late for them? Is it too late for current corporates? Um, I spend a lot of time talking to them. <laughs> uh, and the problem, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about leadership, right? And if you think about what in terms of corporations, there are three qualities of a leader that are associated with the success of any one company. Lead by example, admit mistakes, and see qualities in others. And each of these are actually fundamental to creating an environment of play and creativity. Because the lead example is a space that's trusted. You can't play and experience outside a space that's trusted. Right? To lead, that's lead by example. To admit mistakes is a space that celebrates not knowing, uncertainty. And to see qualities in others is a space that celebrates diversity, right? The, most the best adaptive systems are the most complex, not complicated, but complex. So it's all about leadership. The problem is that often companies try, they, they're maximizing efficiency, they see the need to be creative, and they apply the same rules to maximize efficiency. Well, the best environment for efficiency is competition. It's a great idea in biology, a very bad idea if you're trying to be creative. So they tried to take the old strategies and apply it in a new way. So, but I think that there's hope <laughs> in this. Um, in one of your previous interviews, um, there was a question of the importance of questioning actions. Questioning? Actions. Uh, questioning actions. Yes, uh -huh. and you emphasize that the most important questioning word is why. Yes. So maybe we could have more elaboration on why we're questioning the why more okay. So why, why? So you could argue that one of the most dangerous things we can do throughout history is not an action, it's a word. It's why. Almost all companies are set up to block that word, right? Almost all companies and individuals, we tend to ask questions about things that are measurable. What, where, when, right? These are all things we can get data on. But as you know, data is meaningless. It's useful but meaningless. Right? What you really want to know is why and how. Because if you can understand why, right, not just about a problem you're trying to solve, but maybe about another person, now you have the possibility of a deeper understanding and finding a tr principle that transcends context. And if you can find principles that transcend context, you now become adaptable rather than rigid in rules. Right? And that begins with understanding why, whether again it be an organization or of an individual. Right? So, استاذ نسمو كم بنهم حضرة. أود أن أشكر الدكتور بولوتو على محاضرته القيمة والرد على الأسئلة المطروحة وأشكر أيضا الحضور الكريم على حسن استماعهم. في الختام نجدد الشكر لسيدي صاحب السمو الشيخ محمد بن زايد أنهيان على استضافة هذه المحاضرات الهامة في مجلس السمو. ويرجى العلم بأنه سيكون كسر الصيام والصلاة للرجال في المجلس الرئيسي وسيكون كسر الصيام والصلاة للنساء في هذا المجلس وندعوكم بعدها لتناول وجبة الإفطار في قاعة الطعام الرئيسية في القصر والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته